Oh, okay. We, we mentioned initial roots and we kind of did it the hard way by starting the complete solution using uh, it was manipulating sums, et cetera. It turns out there's two big things about initial roots. For one, we can find the initial roots ahead of time before we start the process of solving. And secondly, initial roots help you characterize the solution. So that's what we'll talk about now. So you have your differential equation, second order homogeneous, like we've been dealing with. Get it into standard form with your P and Q here. It turns out there's a quadratic equation that is derived from the P's and Q's. Here's this quadratic equation. You solve it and you get the initial roots. What are A sub zero and B sub zero? In general, A sub zero is this limit. Multiply the P by X and take the limit as X goes to zero. And the B sub zero is multiply the Q by X squared and let X go to zero. Since in my course anyway, these P's and Q's are always ratios of polynomials. Here's how we would compute them in my course. A sub zero just equals this. X times the P evaluated at X equals zero. B sub zero is X squared times Q evaluated at X equals zero. Um, Let's look at the example we did in the previous recording. Here was the equation as given. Here it is in standard form. So here's our P and our Q. We multiply this P by X, we get minus a half, right? Regardless of what X is. So that's the A sub zero. Here's our Q. If we multiply it by X squared, we get X. And at x equals zero, that's just zero. So b sub zero equals zero. So when we plug those in, what do we say? We get a half for a sub zero, minus a half rather, and then plus zero, which gives us this equation. And the roots are then three halves and zero, which is what we found the other way. Now we found it without manipulating any sums or anything like that just right from the standard form of the differential equation. Now, what, do you, what can you do with that? There's three things that can happen. One of, one of three things is gonna happen. And you could flat figure it out based on the difference between those initial roots. Remember R sub one is always the larger of the two. So, Call this delta R that difference. If that difference is not an integer, you're guaranteed exactly two linearly independent Frobenius series solutions like this. One's based on the larger initial root, the other one's based on the smaller initial root. And in each case, that first coefficient cannot be zero. And the case we just did, the difference was three halves, which is not an integer. So we just did a case one example. And indeed, we got two linearly independent series solutions. If that difference, um, if that delta R, if the difference between the, the roots is an integer, but not zero, then you can't tell at a time if you're gonna get one or two series solutions, Frobenius series solutions. You will get one using the larger initial root. You guaranteed that one. And again, that C sub zero term will not be zero, cannot be zero. You will get a second linearly independent solution, but if this C is not zero, uh, this is not, the whole thing is not in the form of a series solution. This part is a Frobenius series. This part is a Frobenius series. 
but you're not guaranteed that this C is going to be zero. So you might have this natural log of X involved in the uh, solution, the second particular solution. We are not going to cover this type of solution. We're only going to be, I'm only going to be worried about the case where this C in effect turns out to be zero and we do get a second linearly independent Frobenius series solution based on the smaller initial root and that lowest coefficient cannot be zero. So if we're only trying to find out how many Frobenius series, in this case too, we, we can't say. It could be one or it could be two. Case three is where that difference between the initial roots is zero and then you get like a double root. Then you will not get the second theory solution. Your second solution will look like this. It will involve the log of X. And in my course, we're not gonna cover this second solution. But one series solution you do get, the Frobenius series based on the larger initial root. And again, that initial coefficient cannot be zero. So those are the three cases. This is a fairly important chart right here. So in my course, I'm not gonna address those solutions that involve the log of X. You can always find two linearly independent solutions, at least one of which is a Frobenius series. At least in my course, we're interested in the exact number of linearly independent Frobenius series solutions. It could be one or two. Case one, we're guaranteed two. Case three, you're guaranteed you're only going to get one. Case two could be one or two. You don't know, you actually have to solve it. You will always get the Frobenius series solution using the larger initial root. You're guaranteed of that. If there is a second Frobenius series solution that's linearly independent of the other one, it can be found using the smaller initial root. And I re recommend that you always try to do it that way. That coefficient of the lowest power of X in any of these sums is never zero. So we're just gonna set it to one. Here's a very nuanced little thing. If another coefficient appears arbitrary, and I say that appears arbitrary, then we're going to set it to zero. So what does it mean to appear arbitrary? Remember, we get those things from using the identity property. It turns out that the identity property says the C you're looking for, your specific C sub N or whatever, if it could be anything because of what the rest of the term is. If the rest of the term says it's going to be zero no matter what the C is. That's what I mean by it appears to be arbitrary. That's the case, we're going to force it to be zero. I'll try to explain this a little later. Um, so here's a summary of how to characterize things, your series solutions, without fully doing the problem. First, we had this decision table of if, and we, we always center our solutions around zero. So is zero an ordinary point, regular, singular, or irregular singular? If it's ordinary, you'll get power series and you're guaranteed two linearly independent power series. If it's a regular singular point, you're guaranteed at least one Frobenius series, maybe two, and we'll figure that out by the second decision. If, it's an, if zero is an irregular singular point, we don't attempt any series solutions in my course. Um, now, in this case where zero is a regular singular point, then you need the initial roots. We had a formula for how to find them based on the P and Q and using that quadratic formula. 
difference between those two roots is not an integer, you're going to get exactly two Frobenius series solutions that are linearly independent of each other. If they differ by an integer other than zero, can't tell ahead of time. If they differ by zero, meaning it's a repeated root, you'll only get one Frobenius series solution that's independent of any other such solutions. You'll always get a second linearly independent solution, but it might involve that log X. It won't be a pure Frobenius series. Let's see. I'm only gonna ask you to find Frobenius series solutions, not this log X stuff. In all cases, you'll find one solution using the larger initial root. And you set that C sub zero to one. If a second linearly independent Frobenius series solution can be found, it can be found using the smaller initial root. And again, you can't set that lowest coefficient to zero. We're, we'll just set it to one. And if you find any coefficient that looks to be arbitrary, meaning it could be any value and still satisfy the identity property or the recursive relationship, set it to zero. This is, this last point is kind of the only nuanced thing throughout this. The rest of it is pretty algorithmic, just follow the rules. And I'll, I'll do some examples of this uh, in a future review.